So I do have a phrase to remember these seven. It's I have no right or clever friends. I know they're not in order, but that is a mnemonic to kind of remember which ones those are. Um, but they're actually two bonded together. There are a couple that do more than two. Uh, phosphorus, when it's by itself, likes to be P4. Sulfur likes to be S8. You don't really have to know those two, I would tell you that. Uh, but these diatomic ones are kind of important to know. So essentially, these ones are all a nonmetal bonded to a nonmetal. These would be considered covalent bonds. And these ones occur naturally. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to what a chemical formula is, what it means, how you interpret it. Um, essentially, what it does is it represents a molecule. That's a molecule. And what does it tell you? Well, it tells you the number of atoms of each element that are in it, each element. Okay, so the subscript or the little number at the bottom equals the number of atoms. So we're going to write a couple chemical formulas here. These are pretty easy to start off with. It says a phosphorus sulfur compound that is responsible for the ignition of so-called strike anywhere matches has four phosphorus atoms. So phosphorus is P, so it would be a little subscript four, and three sulfur atoms. So then I would write S and a little three. It says per molecule. So if they're bonded together, you write them as a word like this, P4S3, okay? So I'm going to do this next one, ethyl alcohol. The alcohol of alcoholic beverages has one oxygen atom, two carbons, and six hydrogens. So technically, it does not matter what order you put these in. If you just want to list them in the order that they are in, that's fine. Um, usually, carbon is listed first, and then hydrogen and, and oxygen. Um, that's just kind of an organic thing to do. Uh, but like I said, it doesn't technically matter what order you put them in. Um, so I would go C, two, two carbon atoms, H, what does that say, six, and O. You do not have to put the one. One is understood. Um, so you don't need to put a little subscript one there. All right, do C really quick and then check your answer. Okay, it says, this is, oh, Freon 11. That was in automobile air conditioners. And part of the problem we had an ozone, an ozone issue. Has one carbon, so carbon, don't write the one. Three chlorines and one fluorine. Nice, so nothing like that. Now, again, this is where it's important to make sure that you don't capitalize everything. You will use lowercase when you need to. This L should be lowercase, okay? And then this is gonna be your formula for free on 11. Okay, so other representations of molecular structure. We just talked about the chemical formula. This just tells you the number of atoms, right? That's all it says. Number of atoms only. There's a whole bunch of other ways to draw and represent molecules uh, that can actually show you how they're bonded or what it is in three dimensions. So this shows how we're bonded, a structural formula. We'll be drawing lots of those. Um, this one is, oh, sorry, that's this D down here, is how we draw it on paper in 3D. So molecules are actually three-dimensional, of course. Um, it would look like this, but I can't really draw this in three dimensions. So this is what you would draw in 3D if you wanted to draw the molecule. And then there's also a condensed structural formula. It kind of tells you how it's put together. And I'll talk about carbon and how we know what's bonded to it and stuff later. Uh, but this is a little bit more descriptive than just C4 or CH4O. This actually tells me the carbon has three hydrogens on it and then an OH describes how it's put together. Okay, so you're gonna see multiple of these as we go. Chem molecular formula is what we're gonna focus on um, for the rest of this. So I have an example that says, write the molecular formula for each compound. Uh, the condensed structural formula is given. So what I gave you is a structural formula that explains how it is laid out. I want you to make it into a molecular formula. So I essentially want you to condense it. So try that really quick and check your answers. So this is what you should have gotten. The order, again, does not particularly matter. If you have them reversed, that's totally okay. Um, this one down here I want to talk about for a second. These parentheses are like uh, parentheses in math. If you have a number outside of the parentheses, it's called a, a, like a coefficient. It would distribute in. So this little three down here means I have three of the things in parentheses. So technically this would be C3H9N. 
All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk specifically about ionic compounds now. So that, so that was the positive and negative attractive attraction things I talked about. So again, cations are things that are positive. They have a positive charge because they have lost electrons and electrons are negative things. So now they have essentially more protons than electrons. Okay, P plus being protons, which are positive and minus being electrons, which are negative. So essentially what happens if I have sodium, sodium is a metal, it's in group one, and it loses an electron, then it becomes Na plus, Na plus one. Okay, the opposite is true for an anion. They, those are things that gain electrons. Remember I said those are usually non-metals, and that would mean they have less protons than electrons. So they have more negative things, and that's why they have a negative charge. So chlorine likes to take in an electron and turn into chlorine minus. Okay, so things actually have very predictable charges. Most elements like to have one specific charge and you can actually tell those by looking at the periodic table. So I have a periodic table here that actually has charges marked on it for the things that have a set charge. And what this means is when they're in an ionic compound, that's the charge that they have. Okay. Now, if something is by itself, it's not bonded to anything, it probably doesn't have a charge, uh, but if it's in an ionic compound, it's going to have a charge. So the reason they have these charges, and this is something that we'll talk about more in, I think, chapter five or six on periodic trends, um, is that all elements like to look like a noble gas. All elements want to look like a noble gas. And what I mean by that is they want to have the same number of electrons as the noble gases. Noble gases are non-reactive because they're very stable. So things want to get to that stability. So for example, fluorine in group uh, or number nine here wants to look like a noble gas and the noble gas that's closest to it is neon. So what fluorine is going to do is it's going to gain an electron. So it has 10 now. So it looks like neon. And since fluorine only has nine protons, now it has a charge of negative one. Okay, and like I said, we'll get more into the charges later, but actually each group, remember they have similar properties, they also have the same charges. So group one, everything in group one likes to be a plus one charge. Everything in group two likes to be a plus two charge. Everything in group three, and these are the main groups, likes to be a plus three. Um, group four can go either way because technically they're closer to either side. And then we start doing negative. So this group over here, um, group one is this five, likes to gain electrons. So it'll gain one, two, three to get like, to be like a noble gas. So it likes to have a negative three charge. Otherwise it would have to go the other way and I would have to actually lose five. So one, two, three, four, five to be like the other noble gas. So essentially what these are doing is they want to gain or lose electrons to get like the noble gas that's closest to it. Okay, so if you just know that group one is plus one, group two is plus two, group three is plus three, um, four I won't give you, uh, five is minus three, minus two, minus one, and these don't have a charge, that's really all you need to know for right now. Okay, and we'll get more into what's happening later. All right, so they gain or lose electrons, gain or lose electrons to get to that noble gas number. Now, if you've taken chemistry before, you are probably familiar with the octet rule. Uh, they really want zero or eight valence electrons. That's why they have these charges. Again, we're gonna talk more about valence electrons and what those are later. Okay, so we're gonna do some examples really quick. It says predict the charge on the most common monoatomic ion, meaning one atom ion formed by each element. So aluminum, which is used in the quantum logic clock, the world's most precise clock, aluminum's charge likes to be plus three. It's in group three. It would like to lose three electrons. So then it only has 10, which is like a noble gas, which is neon. Okay. Selenium. Selenium is used in many ruby, to make, sorry, ruby colored glass. Selenium is right here. And selenium is gonna like to gain two electrons so it can look like krypton, so it can have 36 electrons. So if it gains two electrons, it likes to be minus two. Now, yttrium, I didn't mark. And that's because sometimes it can have different charges. Yttrium is actually right here next to strontium. If you were to guess, it's probably gonna go this way. One, 
to three and lose three electrons so it can look like argon, okay? So this one actually likes to be plus three. So again, wanting to look like a noble gas. All right, so um, really quick before we go on to like formulas and uh, naming these types of compounds, there's uh, properties that we can predict based on if something is ionic or if it's a covalent compound. So ionic compounds are always crystal-like structures, crystal lattices. So this is an ionic compound. It's very organized and set. Um, so they have crystalline structures. Okay, NaCl is our go-to example for an ionic compound. They are always going to be hard. They're going to have a high melting point, meaning they're very difficult to melt um, because of these attractions. Uh, they are non-volatile. Um, and the word volatile just means it likes to be a gas. To be a gas. We know that sodium chloride doesn't like to turn into a gas when it's just sitting out. Um, they're held together by, and we mentioned this term before, electrostatic interactions, which is just a, an attraction between positive and negative. So held together by positive, negative attraction, AKA electrostatic attractions. So how are covalent compounds different? Uh, a lot of the things are very, very different. So for example, their structure is not a crystal structure. Um, some of them are gases, some of them are liquids. Um, some of them are soft solids. So they have a variety of structures. Uh, they have a low melting point. Most of the time, these are very easy to melt. They are volatile, like to turn into a gas really easily. Uh, and the thing that holds them together is not electrostatic attraction. So keeping like CH4, CH4 is methane. So that's a gas, right? They're not very attracted to each other. So the only thing that keeps methane molecules together is what are called intermolecular forces. So these are held together by weak intermolecular forces. Now, if you break down the word intermolecular forces, that would mean forces between molecules. And that's really what it is. It's like one molecule attracting um, another molecule. And again, this is something we'll get more into later. So otherwise known as attractions between molecules. Okay, so they're pretty weak. That's why they have a low melting point, essentially. Okay, so on to names and formulas. This is gonna be really important for the rest of the semester. You do have to know what names mean, how I can figure out the formula from the name, um, that kind of stuff. So we're gonna start with ionic compounds. They're actually the most complicated ones. Um, so we know that ionic compounds have a cation and an anion. Okay, so there's a couple rules for their formulas. So we know they contain a cation, AKA the positive thing and an anion. Okay, so they're only gonna have two things in them, cation, anion, okay? Um, their formulas always have to be empirical, must be empirical. What does that mean? That just means it is reduced as much as possible. So like if it's Na2Cl2, both of those subscripts are divisible by two, it should actually be NaCl. So these should always be reduced. And finally, their charges need to equal zero. They need to balance out. So if I have a plus two and a minus one of something, I need two of the negative one things so that everything can balance out to zero when you add them together. Okay, so we're gonna do some examples right here. Let's write the correct formula between the ions of all of these things. Now, remember, we know some of these charges right off the bat by looking at this table. Okay, I also gave you a list of these. <laughs> um, and then there's some, and we'll talk about how to figure out the charge if you don't know what the charge is. So all of these are on that chart. Okay, so calcium is in column two, so it's a plus two. Bromine is in group 7A, so it likes to be minus one. Okay, so for those charges to balance out, I'm gonna have one calcium and two bromines, so that that's negative two, so plus two and minus two balance out. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing with the next one. Potassium is plus one, 
sulfur is minus two. So I actually need two potassiums for every one sulfur, okay? Now, um, I have another method to do this when it starts getting more complicated. It's called the crisscross and reduce method, okay? So balancing them out always works, but crisscrossing and reduce might save you some time when you get some more complicated things. So I'm gonna do that with this one. I got lithium, its charge is plus one. Nitrogen's charge is minus three. So I can look at this and be like, oh, well, obviously I need three lithiums for this to balance out for one nitrogen. Um, so I could write that easily, or the crisscross or reduced method means this is going to be the subscript of lithium, and this is going to be the subscript of nitrogen. So it should be Li3N. Okay, makes it pretty easy. I got aluminum is plus three, oxygen is minus two. If I do my crisscross, it'll be Al2O3. Okay, magnesium plus two, phosphorus minus three. It's going to be Mg3P2. Okay, simple as that. Now, if they were reducible, you should reduce them. So if it was two and two, they should be reduced to ones, so on and so forth. All right, so that's how you write the formulas. Now on to naming, okay? They have different nomenclature rules, okay? That word nomenclature just means naming rules, okay? Um, and we have a very systematic way, systemic rules for naming. So everybody knows what you're talking about when you say the name. Um, so ionic rules, um, remember those are uh, going to be usually a metal or what's called a polyatomic ion, and I'll talk about those in a sec, with a nonmetal. Whereas a covalent or molecular structure is going to be a nonmetal with a nonmetal. Okay, and there's different rules for naming them. So before you start to try to name something, you have to determine if it is ionic or if it's covalent. So we're gonna do that first. So this example says to determine if you're ionic or covalent. So that means you have to know where the metals are and where the non-metals are. So sodium is in group one, that is a metal. Uh, sulfur is a non-metal, so this one has to be ionic. Okay, phosphorus and chlorine are both non-metals, so this one's gonna be covalent. Silicon and hydrogen, Silicon is actually a metalloid, so I need to list that here. Covalent molecular can also be metalloids. Okay. So this one's covalent. Iron, that is a transition metal. It's in the middle, so it's a metal and a non-metal. So this one's ionic, and then you should have ionic, covalent, ionic. Okay, so check and make sure you can find out where those are. Like I said, before you even start to name something, you have to know if it's ionic or covalent. Okay. So polyatomic ions, polyatomic ions, let's break this word down, means, poly means multiple or many. Atomic would mean atoms. And ion means something with a positive or negative charge. So a polyatomic ion is something that has a positive or negative charge that's made up of multiple atoms, okay? And that, that's literally what it is. It is one ion composed of two or more elements, and it all together has a net charge, okay? Now, you don't have to memorize the polyatomic ions. Some of them have weird names. They are on the list that I have linked on um, Canvas, so I would print that page for sure, that in the periodic table, so that you have that handy when you're trying to name things. Um, I know them off the top of my head because I use them all the time. You are probably gonna know a lot of them off the top of your head by the end of this class also, but I would print that for now. It's gonna be super helpful. So um, polyatomic ions in formulas, you kind of treat them like any other ion. Okay, so you're gonna use like any other ion. Okay, you still have to like balance out the charges, make sure they add to zero. Um, but if you need more than one polyatomic ion, it's going to be a little bit different. So for example, up here, I needed two bromines, so I just wrote a little subscript two. Now, if you need multiple of a polyatomic ion, since it has multiple things in it, you have to use parentheses. Okay, use parentheses for more than one. Okay, so if you look at your list, um, for example, I'm going to put together aluminum and nitrate. So aluminum has a charge of plus three from the periodic table. 
nitrate is NO3 with a minus one charge. Now, if I put these together, if I'm gonna do my little crisscross method, I need three of these and one of these. So it would be AL. And since nitrate is NO3, I'm gonna put it in parentheses and I'm gonna put a little three on the outside. That means I get three of these things, okay? So multiple polyatomic ions, you need to use parentheses. Okay, so onto the naming rules. There's a couple different categories. Um, there's metals with only one charge. Okay, that's the metals essentially that are listed in this periodic table right here. So things that don't have different charges. Now all the blue stuff, they can have multiple charges. So these guys have specific charges all the time and they're super easy to name. So metals with only one charge, um, which are, I'm gonna write here, mostly main group metals. So like the A's, um, this is how you name, you literally name your metal. Oops. Okay, the metal's gonna be first. And then you're gonna name your non-metal. And you're gonna change the ending to IDE. Okay, so whatever that last part of the element is, you're gonna chop it off and add IDE, super easy. Name metal, name the non-metal IDE. You don't have to worry about the subscripts are, you don't have to worry about um, any of the numbers or anything, just name metal, name not metal, IDE. Now, the only time you don't change the IDE is if it's got a polyatomic ion, okay? So, except polyatomics do not change their names, don't change. Okay, so for example, NO3 is called nitrate. I would just leave that nitrate. I would not change it to ID. That's the only time you don't change it. Okay, now metals with more than one possible charge, for the most part, these are mostly transition metals. So the ones in the middle can have like different charges, right? So they need something extra. So this is how you name these. You name, you still name your metal. And then I'm going to put parentheses here. We need a little something extra. And then at the end, you're going to name your non-metal. Again, ID ending, unless it's polyatomic ion. And what we're going to put right here in parentheses is a Roman numeral that tells us what the charge is, OK? So if it has a charge of plus 2, it's going to have a Roman numeral of 2, OK? And I'm going to show you how to do that here in a minute. And the only way to get good at these is to practice. So there are multiple of these in your homework. Make sure you do your practice. If you need extra practice, go to my website, check them out. So what is the name for these? So these are, you have to check first if it's a transition metal or something that has a variable charge or something that has a constant charge. Well, sodium is an alkaline metal. It's in group one. It is always plus one. Um, so it does not have a variable charge. So I'm literally just going to name the metal. And then the non-metal is bromine, but instead of saying bromine, I'm changing the end to bromide. So this is sodium bromide. All right. I got K2S over here. K, potassium is also an alkali metal. Um, so you better have your periodic table right next to you when you're doing this. Um, it has a plus one charge always. So I can just write potassium sulfide. Change the ending to IDE. Okay. Try these next two. All right, so I kind of got you there because these are both ones with polyatomic ions. So anything that has more than two elements in it, one of them is probably going to be a polyatomic ion. So you should check your chart of your lists of charges. Okay, so SO4 is sulfate. Hi, if you look on your sheet, it's called sulfate. So this is magnesium sulfate. Magnesium, so alkaline earth metal, does not have a variable charge, just magnesium sulfate. This one is lithium phosphate. Again, don't have to worry about the numbers, no variable charge, but BO4 with a minus three charge is called phosphate, okay? Now, these ones are practiced with no Roman numerals. So I'm gonna do A and B over here, or actually I'm gonna do A and C and you guys can try B and D. So A, I've got copper and oxygen. Now copper is a transition metal. If you look at the periodic table, it's in the middle. It can be a plus two or a plus three. It can actually have a couple of different charges. So I know I'm going to have to put a Roman numeral in parentheses, but I'll worry about that in a second. And then the end is going to be instead of oxygen, oxide. Okay. So now what is the charge of copper? Now, I know it has a little two here. That does not mean that that's what its charge is. That means I have two coppers. 
So remember how we did the crisscross to figure out the charges before? Well, if you reverse the crisscross, you would see that this two was from the oxygen. Oxygen actually is a charge of minus two and copper in this case has a charge of minus one, okay? So essentially the best way to look at these and figure out what this Roman numeral is, is to check the other element and then you can figure out your charge. Check your anion first. So oxygen always has a charge of minus two. So that means in this case, since I have two coppers, each one had to be plus one. So it's copper one oxide. All right, I'm gonna do this one over here. MN is manganese, not to be confused with magnesium. Manganese is a transition metal, so I need to have a Roman numeral. And NO3, notice these parentheses. NO3 then should be on my polyatomic ion chart, and it is, it is called nitrate. All right, so what was manganese's charge? Well, I said, check the anion first, right? So nitrate was negative one. And I have two nitrates here. So if I have two nitrates, that means it's negative two. So that must mean magnesium is plus two. Now you could also check the reverse crisscross, right? Two would have gone up there and one would have gone up there. It's manganese two nitrate. So you try the next two and then check your answers. All right, these should be iron three sulfide and cobalt two phosphate. And if you need help finding those charges again, uh, let me or Adara know and we can help you out. Okay, so now the easy one. So naming molecular or covalent compounds is super easy. So instead of doing um, metal and non-metal, and then you might have to have a Roman numeral, they're all non-metals, remember, and it's just going to be two things. These are bimolecular compounds that we're naming. Um, these are actually going to get a prefix, and the prefix equals whatever the subscript was. Okay, so no crisscrossing, no figuring out charges. These don't have charges, remember, they're not ionic. Um, so you would do a prefix is the subscript, and then you would name your first element. And then you would do it again for the second one. The prefix equals whatever its subscript is. And then you would name your second element. But then you need to add an IDE at the end. So everything should end in IDE except if it's a polyatomic ion. That's the only time it worked. Okay. Um, so the prefixes you need to know are essentially if something is a one, it's a mono, two is di, three is tri. These are all ones you should probably be able to figure out. Four, however, is tetra, okay? Five is penta, and then the rest of them are exactly what you would assume they're gonna be um, based on like geometry. Six is hexa and so on and so forth, okay? Um, so four is the one that most of the time people forget. So tetra is four. Um, but the rest of these you should be able to figure out. Now there is one rule. Um, you don't use mono if it's on the first element. Don't use on first element. So your name should never start with mono. You only need it if it's for the second element. Um, so I'm gonna name two of these and then you guys try the other two. So this is carbon. Remember I said you don't use mono on the first one. And I have two sulfurs. It's gonna be disulfide, change that name to ID. Okay, ASBr3, um, AS is arsenic. So this is arsenic tribromine. All right, give these other two a try. All right, so it should be phosphorus, pentachloride, and dinitrogen tetroxide. Now, um, I'm not worried about spelling. So if you write tetraoxide, you know you drop the A, not a big deal. It's really whatever sounds right. Okay. And there is no rule. I always get asked this question about like where to cut off the element name to add IDE. Sometimes it's one syllable, sometimes it's two. Uh, it's really whatever sounds most correct. <laughs> so sorry, there's really no rule for that. So um, we're going to kind of go over the naming rules again. We're going to do a naming flow chart. So remember, the first thing you have to do before you try to name something is figure out, is it ionic or is it covalent, okay? So is it a metal and a non-metal or a polyatomic ion, or is it two non-metals, okay? So that's really important to be able to identify that. If it's, I'm gonna do ionic on this side versus if it's covalent on this side. Okay, if it's ionic, we know that we're gonna do the name of the first metal, and then we're gonna name the non-metal with an IDE ending, pretty straightforward, right? The only time we need to add something is, oh, is there a 
a transition metal or a metal that can have multiple charges, then we need the name plus a Roman numeral and then the nonmetal with an IDE ending. Okay. So remember that Roman numeral equals its charge, not how many of them there are. Roman numeral is the charge. Okay. And then if it, the other thing we need to check is there is a polyatomic ion. And if there is, we don't change the ending. Don't change the ending. That's it. Okay, just name the polyatomic ion. All right, now if it's covalent, we need to make sure we use prefixes. There is no crisscrossing. Uh, you're going to use prefixes and you're going to change the ending to IDE every time. Okay, that's about it. So name these. Remember, use the flow chart. See if you can figure out what kind they are before you name them. And check if you see if you got the right answer. So pause it. It should be fixed on yours, but I noticed I had a typo here. This should have been an SO4. Um, but you should get nickel two chloride. That one was a transition metal. Potassium chromate, not a transition metal. Um, dichlorine monoxide, that one was covalent. Sulfur tetrafluoride, that one was covalent. And ammonium sulfate, this is a polyatomic ion and this is a polyatomic ion. Okay, so now organic compounds. This is a whole other branch of chemistry. You can take organic after this if you're interested. Um, organic is its own naming system. Of course, it has a different naming system. Uh, it used to be that organic things were like living things and inorganic were non-living things. Okay, So that's usually, I know what you and I think of when we think of organic or inorganic. Um, but now it actually essentially means anything that has a carbon base. Okay, So um, we can actually make these pretty easily today. We, we used to not be able to synthesize organic compounds. Now we can make almost any organic compound. Um, so today can synthesize easily. Um, essentially, like I said, they're anything with a carbon base with hydrogen and then sometimes based on what they're used for, we'll have oxygen, nitrogen, oh, that's an N, phosphorus or sulfur. Okay, so that would be what's considered an organic compound. Inorganic compounds are essentially everything else. Um, we can synthesize them pretty easily, but they decompose not very easily. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at. So I'm going to talk about organic compounds now, because uh, like I said, they have a little bit of a different naming system. You're not going to have to worry too much about naming until the very end of the semester. Uh, but anyway, I just want to introduce you to these because we will be using a lot of these compounds. All right, so carbon. Why do we care about carbon? Carbon is very specific about its bonding. It always wants four bonds. Once four bonds. Okay, it's very stable when it's got its four bonds. Um, it makes a whole lot of different molecules. Now it can be four single bonds, or it could be two double bonds, or it could be a triple bond and a single bond. Um, but it's always going to want to have four bonds. So you can have double and triple bonds. Um, we'll talk about how to draw those and stuff later. Um, they also can form straight chains. This is a straight chain. Can form branches, say carbon to a carbon, and they got hydrogens on here, or ring structures. And these are all considered organic. So they can form straight branched and ring structures. And you might start to see a pattern in how some of these are named. So this is propane. This branched one is isobutane. Um, notice it has a different number of carbons and cyclohexane, anything that's in a circle is going to be a cyclo. Okay, now they can also, I mentioned double and triple bonds. So this thing has a double bond. So see each carbon still has four bonds. The double bond counts as two bonds. You can have a triple bond. So this is ethene, this is ethylene, or sorry, ethine. Ethylene, I just had ethylene on the mind. So ethine, ethene, ethine. Um, this is acetic acid. This is organic carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. Hey, these are some really common molecules that you guys are going to see. Uh, so if I say ethene, you should probably be able to picture what that looks like. So um, all compounds can be classified as either inorganic or organic. In organic, we kind of have two subsections. There's hydrocarbons. Uh, if you break that word down, it's hydrogen and carbon. So anything that's only hydrogen and carbon is a hydrocarbon. Um, there's also functionalized hydrocarbons, and those have things attached to them. They have functional groups with 
functional groups. And so if something has a functional group, um, then that means it can do some other things. So they have different functions. So we're gonna talk about what functional groups are as well. So um, some really common hydrocarbons are on this list here. I got methane, propane, butane. Notice these all have an ane at the end. They have all straight structures and pentane. And then ethene has a double bond, ethine has a triple bond. These are all really useful things, okay? So um, I actually wanna talk about the prefixes here really quick. So they actually tell you something. Anytime it's just one carbon, it's going to have a prefix of meth something. It could be methane, could be methene, or methene is not a thing. Um, a methyl group means it has a, one carbon in it. Two carbons, the prefix is eth, eth something. Three carbons is prop, so propane has three carbons in it. You can see it right here. Four carbons is but, so butane has four carbons. Um, five carbons is pent, and like the rest, five and up are exactly what you would expect. Hex, het, oct, all of those. Um, it's really just the first four that are a little weird, okay? Um, I do have a mnemonic for these. The way I remember these is Mary, Eats peanut butter, M-E-P-B. Sounds hard to remember. So anyway, um, however many carbons they have actually affects what their name is going to be. Okay, so you might have noticed that the first ones that don't have any double or triple bonds um, end in ane, A-N-E. Those are actually called alkanes, okay? This is when they are all carbon, carbon, single bond. Okay, they have a generic formula. It's always gonna be like however many carbons there are. So Cn, H, it's gonna be 2N plus two. So if I have two carbons, then that means I'm gonna have two times two plus two hydrogen. So it would be six, C2H6. So you can actually predict the formula of any size of alkane. All right, uh, there, another word for these is saturated hydrocarbons. Saturated hydrocarbons. That just means it doesn't have any double or triple bonds. It has as many hydrogens as it possibly can bonded to all of those carbons. And they can be straight chains or they can be branched, okay? All considered alkanes, which brings us to cycloalkanes. So that's an alkane that has been turned into a circle or the chain reconnects to itself. Chain reconnects to itself. Okay, now in order to do this, to keep all of our four bonds on carbon, it's actually gonna lose two hydrogens. So its generic formula is gonna be CnH2n. So you can predict the formula of a cycloalkane. Okay, and then that brings us to alkenes, anything that ends in ENE, -E, these ones have a double bond, have a double bond. Okay. These would be considered, instead of saturated, they are unsaturated hydrocarbons. And that's just because it doesn't have as many hydrogens as it could possibly have. And so I could add more hydrogens and break some of those double bonds. So anytime you have a double or triple bond, it's called unsaturated. So we're talking about saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats have double bonds. Saturated fats don't have any double bonds. Okay. Um, something that's special about alkenes is that they can make what are called cis and trans isomers. Can make cis and trans isomers. So there's a couple words here we need to talk about. Isomers, first of all, means things that have the same formula but are put together differently. Okay, so I got cis 2 butene here and trans 2 butene. These have the exact same formula, but if you notice, my hydrogens are on the same side and these CH3 groups, which are methyl groups are on the same side. And they're just kind of switched on this one. My methyl groups are on opposite sides and my hydrogens are on opposite sides. So if they are on the same side, it says same side. And if those groups are on opposite sides, then it's gonna be a trans group. Excuse me, so it's gonna be a trans isomer. Okay, so that's what those mean. 
All right, so those are some of the main types. The last thing I wanna talk about are functional groups. And that's groups that are put onto hydrocarbons to make them have other functions, do other things. So groups can add, and I say different functions because the name is functional group, um, but really what I mean is they react differently. So groups can add reactivity. Um, you could add a carbon group because these aren't listed on this chart under here, um, but carbon groups are like a CH3 group, which is called a methyl group because it has one carbon. Um, a CH2, CH3 group is an ethyl group because it has two carbons, okay? So there's some carbon groups you can add or you can add things that are not carbon groups and those are all listed on here. Okay, so functional groups are essentially things that you can add on to give different functionalities. We already talked about alkenes. Alkynes are things with triple bonds. Alcohols are things with OHs on them. Haloalkanes are things that have halogens on them. Amines are things with nitrogen in them. Aldehydes have a double bonded oxygen um, on the end specifically. Ketones have a double bonded oxygen in the middle of the compound. Carboxylic acids have a double bonded O and an OH. So it's like an alcohol, but it also has a double bonded O. Esters have a double bonded O and a single bonded O in the middle of a compound, not on the end. And amides have a double bonded O and a nitrogen or amines. So these are kind of different functional groups. They give different things, structures and functionality. Um, and that's gonna be really important when we get to like organic and biochemistry, uh, which is really a uh, topic for 162. So you guys are just gonna see some of these molecules and that's why I wanted to introduce them to you.